Conservatives need to do three things if we want to get back in power. We need to show restraint at home. We need to show restraint abroad. And we need to show restraint with our rhetoric. Now, the first of those three, kind of difficult for some Republicans to face up to, for some reason, despite the fact that when Bush took over, we had a $155 billion surplus. When he left, we had a $1.5 trillion deficit. We, of course, also doubled the national debt when we were in power from 5.7 to about $11.5 trillion. But eventually, most Republicans came to admit that Republicans had done a miserable job when it came to showing restraint at home. The third prong also very difficult, uh, which was we needed to show restraint in our rhetoric. Uh, but I've been hammering away with this message for quite some time that it's probably not going to help conservatives win swing voters in the suburbs of Philadelphia or in the I-4 corridor in central Florida uh, to call Barack Obama a Marxist, fascist, racist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think most Republicans are starting to understand that, too, that we should actually argue issues and try not to make it quite so personal. Check number two. But what I found the most difficult issue to explain to conservatives who have really seen the definition of conservatism and a conservative foreign policy distorted over the past decade was the need for Republicans to show restraint abroad. And that's really what this is about. We, can, we certainly can talk about Afghanistan, and we will. But we need to show restraint abroad. Um, and we need to do it, first of all, to our own, to conservatives. But also, we need to have leaders that are willing to go out and forcefully make this argument to the American people. Because right now, it's not only hard for conservative leaders to grasp the importance of restraint abroad, it's difficult for Americans to grasp. There's a new NBC News Wall Street Journal poll that came out two days ago. Barack Obama is upside down in his approval ratings when it comes to the economy, when it comes to health care, when it comes to just about every single issue, deficits, debt. But when it comes to his handling of Afghanistan, he's plus 18 percentage points. His handling of Iraq, he's plus 15 percentage points. When it comes to his handling, well, not actually his handling of Iran, but whether we should invade Iran. Actually, plus 14. Americans believe that if we think that Iran is moving towards having nuclear weapons, we should invade the third Muslim country in a decade. Uh, so with this backdrop, I would, rec I would suggest that one of the reasons why those numbers is are skewed as much as they are, is in 2010, there's not much difference between the Republicans' view of foreign policy and the Democrats' view of foreign policy. And I've got to echo what Ed said. I, I, I don't really understand why the president's approval rating is so high when it comes to Afghanistan, because he's doubled the troops. This anti-war president has doubled the number of troops in Afghanistan to nearly 100,000. We've spent $33 billion more. He's asking for more. And he's continued, I think most uh, critically, he's, he's continued the transformation of the Afghanistan effort from a counterterrorism mission to a nation-building mission. There's no end game. There's no exit strategy. There's no definition of success for Afghanistan. We've got no idea what the ultimate price is going to be. And there's actually no answer to, I believe, for Joe Biden, a very prescient question. If, in fact, Pakistan is the most dangerous country on the planet and the key to resolving the crisis in this area, why are we spending 50 times the amount of money in Afghanistan as we are in Pakistan? This policy doesn't make sense. It did to me in 2001. It simply doesn't anymore in 2010. And if Leon Panetta is to be believed, 
that Al Qaeda has been reduced to a quivering mass of a terrorist movement, great. Let's declare victory and bring our troops home. 